Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to our second uh, lecture or webinar series in leadership and in wellness um, for AO North America. Hi. Oh. I have the privilege to introduce Dr. Vonda Wright, who I've known for decades at this point, which has been a privilege as well. Uh, we met each other as when I was a spine, um, when I was doing my spine AI, and she was an orthopedic resident at the University of Pittsburgh. I was a medical student and um, had the opportunity to work with her on a rotation where we were working very hard and very long and has always been a role model to me. Um, in addition to doing her residency at the University of Pittsburgh, she completed a sports and shoulder fellowship at HSS in New York, and then went back to work as well as I did at the University of Pittsburgh in the sports department. There she was the uh, inaugural medical director of the Lemieux Sports Center. And then after a, um, a career at the University of Pittsburgh, she then became um, the chief of Northside a hospital in Atlanta and built up their orthopedic program as well. Now she's currently in Lake Nona working with Houston Orthopedics. And again, we've come full circle. She is my partner here as well. And uh, we get to share many interests outside of orthopedics and within orthopedics. Not only is she an amazing physician, which I've got to see firsthand, but she's an author of five books, a researcher, which she started the performance and research, research initiative for master athletes or PRIMA and has taken a, a, an interest in conversations that aren't always clinically related, but are very important for physicians. So I'm glad that everyone's tuning in because I think this is not only going to be very enlightening for a lot of us, but for me thinking that I'm going in the right direction, but probably don't have all the answers. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Vonda Wright, who's going to be talking to us about peak performance as we are in our mid careers. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for having me and uh, the AO. You know, I got to teach for the first time in the AO in Davos, Switzerland, as you were initiating your sports courses. And um, it was a true honor. And so it's a true honor to be with you here tonight. And so, um, gosh, I'm thrilled that there are over 300 people registered because um we work really really hard taking care of other people and we devote our youth uh to training to do that and so uh this is a talk all about what i've learned on the road not only through my surgical journey but in learning how to help surgeons take care of themselves so i hope it's useful to you and i look forward to your questions but first i wanted to tell you a little bit about me and why i show up to work every day this is a slide. Sometimes our department chair, Freddie Fu, asked me to make a bio slide. So that's thus all the pictures of me. But what it really shows you in all the things Dr. Blackwick described is my why. Why do I show up every day as an orthopedic surgeon? And, you know, just like you, I am very mechanical. I love putting metal in things. But I show up every day because I realize that by saving mobility, which is what I think we are as orthopedic surgeons. And I know there's lots of different kinds of surgeons here tonight. But for my case, as an orthopedic surgeon, I realized that in some senses, I'm the gatekeeper of mobility and that the real tool that I have to use is mobility to save people from the ravages of chronic disease. And as I progress tonight, you'll see I'm really passionate about this. And this is my why um, for showing up every day as a surgeon. Uh, Lisa said I was originally with her at UPMC, and uh, this is a, a picture of the UPMC Lemieux Sports Complex. Um, and I'm currently in Lake Nona, Florida, which is a suburb of uh, Orlando. And my office is right in the middle of yet another sports complex. And that's significant as uh, we are saving mobility to save people from the ravages of chronic disease. And here's some of the gorgeous children in Lake Nona on our indoor football field that we get to take care of. Another reason I love showing up uh, every day, but most of my work and the work I'm gonna be presenting to you tonight has been done in master's age athletes. So basically people like you and me, uh, masters, uh, if I'm air quoting for those of you who can't see me, um, 
is defined as 40 and over. Now the NIH for grant purposes usually defines it as over 35, but you get the picture. We are no longer on an Olympic pathway. We are recreational, although sometimes very high level. So, and these are some of my patients from over the years. Oh yes, I throw this in here. These are all pictures from Lake Nona surgeries. I've been here about a year uh, that we're doing. But I love technology. And so what we've brought to Lake Nona in the last year are these uh, advances in needle scoping. This is a, a actually now an old needle scope that I use that does not require incisions. I thought I'd throw that in because that's kind of cool because I know you're techie out there too. Um, I also do a lot of orthobiologics and I just throw those in because when interestingly, when I talk about subjects like performance, and um, and longevity. Sometimes people wonder if I'm still a practicing surgeon, and yes, I am. But what powers me to talk about things like this with my peers like you is not only because I'm talking about we work so hard, we've spent our youth, uh, many of us have sacrificed our youth to get where we are today, but I will contend to you that one of the uh, one of the great qualities that we have and one of the biggest detriments that we have is that we take care of everybody else first. So tonight's talk on how to live in peak performance, tonight, here's a little roadmap. We're going to talk about what is actually peak performance. And um, I'm going to tell you my opinion. I'm going to share with you what I've learned from a year, from years, more than 20 years, as a, a sports surgeon taking care of really elite performers and what their thoughts are, what are some of the characteristics of peak performance? I'm going to tell you um, many characteristics, but then I'm going to tell you how, specific, specifically how to prepare for pressure, because to be in peak performance takes preparation, just like to be a master surgeon. To be elite what you do, you continually invest in CME and performance enhancement. And yet I contend to you that many of us leave, leave our personal uh, physical and mental performance to chance as we take care of other people. So then I'm going to talk to you about preparing for pressure, both physically, I'm going to share with you some research so you just don't think I'm an exercise Pollyanna, I have actually done the work. Uh, uh, to prove that you can be healthy, vital, active, joyful, long into the foreseeable future. Then we're going to talk about a few of the mental resilience tactics that we have available. Um, and then I'm going to really uh, pivot to you, away from theory, away from research. And I'm going to share with you three of the physical peak performance methods that I prescribe for my patients in programs that I call precision longevity. At this point, I've divided my practice into pure orthopedics and um, health consulting. And so uh, we'll share with you three of the mental and three of the physical tactics that you can use on yourself because tonight is all about you. And so let's go. That was a long preamble, but let's go. You know, listen, before I change the slides, we're going to be talking about peak performance and it's rare, right? We all function at a high level, but those days when we're truly reaching our ultimate potential in the perfect nexus of our physical bodies, our physical brain, our emotional minds, it's rare, right? And we as surgeons think we have to be perfect all the time, but let's be honest as we go forward. So there's no pretense that we're having to live up to perfection. Most days, there's a vast differential between what we're actually capable of in peak performance and how we're performing. And so today's talk is meant to support you uh, in your efforts as peak performers. So actually, this is a picture of Lake Nona. I thought I'd throw in. This is a picture of Lake Nona 10 years when I 10 years ago when I started being affiliated uh, with this community that is all about innovation, technology, uh, medicine, there are four hospitals here in a very small area, as well as sports. 
what I, the reason I threw this up here is because um, it's the perfect example of what peak performers do that we will return to. Peak performers, being in peak performance is envisioning what is possible and working to get there. So as we progress, we'll end with a similar slide and I'll show you Lake Nona today because living in peak performance takes us from a place where there might not be that many days of, of excellent work into a place we envision where we're peak performers. So I was telling you, I get to talk to a lot of great people um, in my practice. And I thought I'd share with you some of their thoughts about what peak performance actually is. What are we actually talking about? What does it look like? So on this one occasion in Lake Nona, I got to talk to these three men. Uh, you may recognize some of them, but if not, I'm gonna tell you who they are. The first guy next to me in the brown suit uh, is Russell Wilson. He's an MVP quarterback. And um, in this interview of him, I said, hey, Russell, so what does it mean to you to be a peak performer? And what is that quality that enables you to go from high school player, 1% of people then get to become college players, less than 1% of them get to be professional players. And, and then what does it take to be a peak performer and be an MVP? And here's what he says in his mind. And I want you to think about when you have been in moments of peak performance, which is probably every day in the operating room, but what it means to you. But for Russell Wilson, MVP quarterback, to him, peak performance is in the midst of chaos, when everything is going wrong, peak performers can be precisely clear thinking. They keep their wits about them. So for Russell Wilson, this is when he's dropping back uh, in the pocket and the defensive line is coming at him. He's not sure that his guards are going to take care of him. He does not panic. He stays on course. He is extremely focused and the world goes silent for him because in his moments of peak performance, his brain is slowed down. He perceives everything clearly and he keeps his wits about him. So that's what Russell Wilson thinks peak performance is. The next guy next to him is a cardiologist by training. He's his name is Deepak Chopra. You've probably heard of him. He's a world-renowned uh, expert on the mind-body connection um, and Ayurvedic medicine. So for Deepak Chopra, the founder of the mind-body zone, when I asked him about peak performance, he talked about being present in the moment, almost stepping outside the moment as if He's looking down on himself, doing whatever he's doing, but in another presence of mind, he sees the whole room from a different perspective. And then finally, which is a very different perspective than, than, Hugh Her than um, Russell Wilson's. Finally, the last guy uh, in the last chair is a very interesting robotics professor from MIT. His name is Hugh Her. Hugh Her has a beautiful brain and I love talking to him. But his story is that he was, in, a, in addition to being an MIT professor, he's an elite mountain climber. And he got caught on a mountain um, in an avalanche and got frostbite. Luckily, he was rescued. However, when he woke up, he was in a hospital bed. And when he looked down, he had undergone life-saving surgery, but it resulted in losing both of his legs above the knee. So as a peak performer, unbelievably, Hugh describes that moment. He didn't panic. It wasn't chaos for him. He looked down at his legs. This is me looking like he was telling this story. And he said, huh, I don't have any legs anymore. I'm missing some body parts. And literally he's saying this to himself, huh? And so instead of panicking, he started to believe in what he could not see. And he built himself some robotic legs. 
And he tells the story that he built these legs with the capacity to grow. In the first couple of weeks, he wore them every day. He would increase his height by about a, a quarter inch. And it took two weeks for people to notice that he was growing. And I love that story. But for Hugh Herr, in the chaos of a tremendous tragedy, as a peak performer, he did not panic. His perspective on peak performance is that we have the mindset of hope, of hope that we can have what we cannot see. So those are three very different perspectives on peak performance from three very different people. When I think of my own perspective on peak performance, because I consider all of us elite performers, we're surgeons, we've done the work. Um, for me, peak performance is in the OR when I almost get in this flow state and there's that bliss that comes over me when we get in that place in the OR, when, when I'm in the most difficult part of a case, and when you know the chitter chatter stops, I stop talking about collegiate football. Remember, I'm a sports doctor. We stop talking about football or how in the world that Tennessee beat Alabama. I'm in the South and the room is quiet and I'm in a flow state. And that moment gives me joy. And that's what peak performance feels for me. You know, this morning, one more perspective as you're thinking about what is it? And how do you get there? I talked to my husband this morning about this talk. And um, my husband is a peak performer. He's a two-time Stanley Cup champion. We just finished the hockey season. I said, hey, Pete, what is what is peak performance to you? And he said, you know, Vaughn, in hockey, there are 85 games. And most of them in the regular season. And around 55 before the... Um, the all-star break are called the dog days. You were just going to work, you're grinding it out. And he said, a peak performer is a person that even in the dog days, even when you're scrubbing through your 12th case, even in the dog days, every moment is elevated. And I thought that was a, or that you're working that every moment is excellent and you never let down. And so these are my patients. Even my patients are peak performers. They're, they're everyday people like you and me, except they challenge themselves every day. So what is peak performance? Well, this is how I put it together from talking to all those people, from talking to my patients. Peak performance is being able to have a complete connection in your body, in your brain, in your bliss, a sense of joy in the moment to make sense out of chaos and have the faith like you heard, the faith to believe and see something that does not exist. That is how I've put together what it means to be in peak performance. But what are the characteristics of peak performers? Well, I wanted to make this simple. So I everything's a P in this talk. P characteristics of peak performers are passion, practice, and personal authenticity. And I want to stop again and, and just acknowledge that as perfectionists, maybe I'm putting this on myself. Maybe you're not a perfectionist, but I suspect you are. As a perfectionist, the truth is. Peak performance, 1,440 moments a day, how many minutes there are a day is difficult. But even in the dog days, as we're looking to, to the future with hope that every moment can be excellent. So the first set of questions I want you to think about as we think about what it takes to be a peak performer and the motivation to be a peak performer is who do you want to be, right? If you have no motivation to elevate, that's okay. There is no judgment in that. It's But you have to know who do you want to be? How can you, number two, how can you make your motions, those dog days when we're just grinding through long days, how can we make your motions into excellence? Then 
How do you optimize the motions to make performance easy? And then finally, as leaders of medical teams, how do you as leaders pull up your team with you? So let's first talk about authenticity. A characteristic of a peak performer is personal authenticity. What does that mean? Well, you know, something else really pivotal that Hugh Herr, the mountain climbing MIT robotics professor said is peak performers are authentic. And what that means is we serve our values, not our egos. What does that mean? Who am I and how do I get what I need, right? But let's say that again. Authenticity is serving your values, not your ego. That's an important distinction because it 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 points to motivation. Why are you here? Why are you trying to be the best surgeon possible? Why are you trying to be a world authority? Why are you serving your patients the way they are? Is that because it is who you are? This is who you want to be? Um, is it because you truly are internally motivated? Or, you know, honestly, some of us were motivated externally by our parents. You're a smart kid, go be a doctor. Oh, no, not just a doctor, be a surgeon. Are you internally motivated? Or are you externally motivated? It's it's an important self reflection thing, because sometimes when we get burnt out, which you will be talking about next month, um, it's because our motivations don't align with, with our external motivations don't align with our real motivations. So the question is, in being a peak performer, are you being authentic and serving your values instead of just your ego? And here's a thought, you know, sometimes, and this happens to a lot of surgeons, and I and I know people that it has happened to, including myself, that sometimes being a peak performer at work means that there's a large gap with how we're performing at home, right? Or because we want to be totally present at home, we may or may not be a peak performer at work. And being authentic is just being reflective enough to understand that there is no judgment in one or another, but understanding that about yourself. If we are serving our values, not serving our egos, we are being authentic and the climb to peak performance will be easy because here's the deal. If you're serving your values, authenticity and being who you are and showing up every day as a peak performer is your superpower, right? is your superpower, being authentically who you are is your superpower. The second characteristic of a peak performer is being passionate, right? To be best in class, you have to really love what you do. If you do not love what you do, it is no harm, no foul, even as a surgeon, to take your talents and put them into another basket, a basket that you can love a basket that you authentically want to devote your life to. And if that is no longer surgery, it's okay, right? Authenticity, being passionate about what you're doing. Sometimes that's easy. You are you may be right where you need to be. Sometimes it takes deep enough reflection to know that you have to pivot. So I'll tell you my story on this. I've made several large career pivots in my life. Lisa was telling you that in the nearly two, two, 20 years, two decades, I was at UPMC. Uh, I was really passionate about what I was doing. I was serving my values. I wanted to be an elite doctor in an elite place. But I got to the place where I realized that I had reached the ceiling of promotion where I was going to be. I, I, as the medical director of the Lemieux, that would have been my last stop. And I would have been there for you know the remaining of my career. And there would have been nothing wrong with that. It was a wonderful job. But if I am authentic and I know I have more capacity and I have a passion to lead and I see a, uh, a 
pivot that needs to happen to be truly authentic, to be a peak performer and to be passionate, then sometimes you have to pivot. And so what that meant for us is uh, we pivoted, we moved from Pittsburgh to Atlanta so that I could exercise those capacities um, that I knew I had. And so sometimes being a peak performer is hard. So as you're thinking through this, what does it mean for you to be a peak performer? Are you living in your values or are you living in your egos? And what are you truly passionate about? Sometimes it takes strength and courage to make those pivots. It's just something to think about. And then finally, a characteristic of peak performers is practice. I mean, it doesn't come easy. You have to practice being a peak performer. So we're going to spend most of the rest of our time together talking about preparing for pressure. But before we do, I want to talk about prepare your perspective, right? So a peak performer like Russell Wilson doesn't panic in chaos, right? And let's explore what he said to me. So Russell Wilson was in his first um, Super Bowl and he threw two interceptions. And he's standing there having to salvage this game or maybe not, they lost. And in that moment, he said to me, you know what? I had just thrown my second uh, interception. I could have stood there saying, looking into the past, Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I used to be such a great quarterback. What's happened to me? Uh, I'm miserable. He could have had that perspective. Or standing, having to take the next action, he could have looked to the future and say, oh my God, will I ever be a good quarterback again? Will I complete this pass? Am I gonna salvage this game? But he did not. He did not panic in chaos. He did not look to the past and assign value. He did not look to the future and assign value. He just uh, looked at the situation neutrally. This is what I have to do. Narr and the reason I bring up this is because perspectives matter. If everything, every time there's a glitch in the road, we either refer to the past and punish ourselves for mistakes, or we look to the future and wonder, am I an imposter? Can I ever truly be as good as I want to be? instead of staying in the moment, evaluating what needs to be done, that's difficult. So preparing our perspective matters. The second part of practice is preparing for pressure. Now, why do we need to prepare for pressure, right? We're surgeons, but here's the deal. Business leaders and executives and medical leaders, in fact, these data that I, I use this slide for executives, we work a lot more than they do, but even business leaders work 23% more than the staff that they manage. Sleep much less than eight hours a day. Certainly we do that sometimes. And But here's the kicker, live a sedentary life. 73% uh, of all leaders live a sedentary, sedentary life with 40% crossing the line into obesity, diminishing the effort they put into success by creating disease and brain fog. So I bring this slide up to recognize that what we do is hard and that we often work much more than everybody else, sleep less than everybody else, and take care of ourselves very minimally, such that we get to middle age. This is this is the conversation I had with my fat, myself. You know, I'm passing all these milestones, passing the first parts of my career, passing the first parts of, of raising my family, getting enough birthday candles on my cake that I could frankly uh, burn down my kitchen. And I get to middle age. Or, in, you know, in my case, I'm kind of in the last decade of my career. Getting way past midlife, having sacrificed my youth on the altar of success. And I got to the point wondering, will my health last? Can I be a peak performer forever unless I pay a lot of attention? Will my health last? And if I could see you, I might see some heads nodding. 
You have sacrificed your youth on the altar of success. Will my health last? Because if we're like the people we take care of, here are the statistics. 40% of us will have a heart attack in our lifetimes. 50% will have cancer and half of us will die from it. 30% will develop diabetes. But here's the deal, doctors. These are all preventable by intention and preparing for the stress that we live under, which is part of being a peak performer. Because the reality is, and I don't need to tell you, although doctors are some of the least healthy people, health and performance are one. So what I've done in my practice is I've designed programs for surgeons and peak performers and anybody who wants them that are centered around the molecular science of aging, precision lifestyle prescription, and mindset mobilization so that we can continue to be peak performers and take care of ourselves in the way we take care of everybody else. Because here's another reality. Because of the advances in modern medicine and um, occupational safety, the life expectancy in this country now is around 79 years for men, 80 years for women. And if you lived in Japan, it would be about 85 years. But what is our health span? What are the number of healthy years on average even if we have one of these diagnoses before 63, most of them become symptomatic around 63. And for our patients, those are the ones that come into your office and say, I spend most of my time in doctor's offices now. So there's a gap between our health span, which on average is about 63, and our life expectancy. And so the question is, what are we going to do to prepare for pressure? as peak performers to extend our health span to equal our life expectancy? That's the question. But the good news is we live in the new age of medicine where we're no longer in the period of medicine where we're watching and modifying like we have been for the last hundred years. But now because we have sequenced the genome and have uh, nanotechnologies and biomarker assessments, we can have precision medicine for each and every one of you. And I'm gonna go over some of those things today. So let's talk about how to build resilience, both physical and mental, and prepare for the stresses we have as a peak performer. And we're gonna talk about mental resilience first. So during COVID, when uh, I shut our offices down in Atlanta for six weeks, and then we had a very light schedule. I don't know what you guys went through, but I had a lot of time on my hands I never had. And I started recognizing that as surgeons, we have one of the highest suicide rates of any profession. And I started looking at why that is. You know, we're, we work hard, we're tough people. And I got really, really interested in the subject of hardiness and resilience. Resilience and hardiness is a constellation of personality characteristics associated with high performance under stress, right? You would think all surgeons are resilient and many are, and yet many of us burnt out, burn out and a disproportionate number of us take our own lives. So I really started to study it. Uh, the research is fascinating. The research that I uh, dug deep on was performed on three groups of people, prisoners of war, uh, largely in the Vietnam War, current army rangers and that class of military, and then finally groups of civilians who have gone through terrible life trauma. And when uh, Paul Bartone and Stephen uh, Stein studied those people, they came up with 10 resilience factors. Here they are. All resilient, hardy people have these common characteristics. They confront their fears. They are realistic optimists. They have systems of social support. They have role models and moral compasses. They have a North Star. They have religious and spiritual practices. They accept things that they cannot change. They take responsibility for their feelings. They have a platform for personal growth. And then surgeons, 
all three groups, no matter who they were, even prisoners of war locked in cages, used physical fitness to maintain their mental sharpness and emotional strength. Isn't that amazing? Physical fitness helps maintain mental sharpness and builds hardiness. So when we think of hardiness and resilience, there are three aspects. There are uh, the aspects of challenge. And this is the tool that I use. If you're interested in this, you have my cell phone number or you will at the end, an email, you're welcome to reach out. If you're wondering where you fall on the total hardiness scale, there are three baskets. There's the challenge basket, meaning do you see, how do you respond in challenge? Do you see it as an opportunity or does it paralyze you? Now, remember, hardiness can be totally trained. So no matter where you would fall on this, you can improve it. Number two, um, the aspect is control. Do you feel in moments of chaos that even things you don't control, you are willing to step out and take the next little step? Even if you don't control all of the surroundings, can you take the next step? And then finally, commitment. What's your purpose? Why do you show up and make the donuts every morning? For me, remember, it is saving mobility saves lives. So what is your commitment and purpose? Those three aspects of hardiness can be completely trained. So here are, I'm going to give you three tips on how to build mental resilience. And, you know, in an hour, we don't really have time to go deep. But uh, if you want more information, just get a hold of me. I'm easy to find. Number one, to build mental resilience, which I call stress inoculation, you must uh, challenge your body in 10% more every week. Stress inoculation, increase the stress on your body. Number two, learn a new skill and free up some bandwidth. And the last one, which we're gonna, I'm gonna give you three very specific techniques for is train your emotions. You know, can we stay calm? in the midst of chaos? Can we not explode into anger and wanna throw instruments? Can we step into the moment and realize that the past does not dictate the future and how do we solve where we are now? So let's talk about three ways to train the emotional brain. When I am working with people to build uh, hardiness, build to exercise the muscle of hardiness, we talk about a technique called re reappraisal. You know, listen, something bad has happened. A stressful situation has happened. It seems in the moment like it's happening to you. You may not even feel like a participant. You may feel out of control. But the technique of reappraisal is taking the time usually to write out, to fully describe this chaotic, stressful situation. You're writing longhand or typing longhand. What happened? Just write it out top to bottom, it slows your brain down. It helps you remember details. Number two, after you've written it out, reread it and think, you know, how could that have been any worse? And then write down the aspects of how it would have been worse. It helps put into perspective this situation and helps you not recreate extra details. How could have it been worse? Next question, reevaluate it. How, how could it have been better? You know, how could we have done better? Next, create a different story about the worst version. You know, it could have been worse. Here's how it could have been. Then create a story about the best version. And as you're going through these steps, it will help you back off the chaos, slow down your brain and really reappraise the situation and put it in perspective. Now, I'm not saying that every time there's a stressful situation, we have to reappraise and retrain the emotional brain. But if, but if your brain reacts by spinning out, which is pretty common, taking these steps to reappraise will train the emotional brain and build your hardiness and put you in more control of situations. So that's number one. 
Number two, mindfulness. Paying focused attention to the here and now. This is the Deepak Chopra technique. Staying on purpose in the moment, observing what's going on non-judgmentally. Deepak Chopra would say, observe the breath. Take a moment to observe the breath. So staying mindful, staying in the moment. And then the third technique that I love a lot. I learned from Chris Voss, who's a master negotiator. He's the CIA's historic number one hostage negotiator. And his suggestions for calming the emotional brain in times when it's chaos and you're out of control, frankly, is just to smile during the situation, to conscientiously make yourself smile. Sometimes when you're in a heated conversation, you need to label things. Here's how I did this. I am a woman from the North. I was trained in New York and Pennsylvania, and we worked fast up there in the North, right? When I moved to the South, I realized that my speed of work and my speed of just the way I did it, not better or worse than what was happening, was stressful for people. So what I did was label conversations. Here how, here's how it went. We're going to have a meeting to solve X problem. I want you to understand that I am a woman from the North and I am going to address this problem passionately. By labeling it, it took everybody, it took everybody's escalation down because they know, oh, she's just going to be passionate about the way we're talking about this. Nobody's in trouble, right? Labeling a situation, or this may be making you feel angry as you're having conversations. Just label what's going on. His third technique is called mirroring, which is the simple technique of reflecting what someone has just said to you. And because most people can't stand a silence, they'll keep talking and you'll get a bigger understanding of what's truly going on. They will reveal the real stress point. And finally, Chris Voss suggests, suggests the FM DJ voice. I use this every day because you can hear in my voice that I have a higher pitched voice. I talk fast, but when I need to slow down a stressful situation, to calm the, my emotional brain, to calm the room's emotional brain, I slow down my speech cadence. I lower my voice and I may even soften it. And that takes the stress and edge out of the room. And it's a way to train and calm the emotional brain and build hardiness. So those are three techniques and steps that you can use when you're training the emotional brain for peak performance. And then finally, we are lucky in my office to have a partner called Lestri, Nestri, where we actually train the physical brain. You can train the physical brain just like you train muscles. So this is fascinating. And, I, and the way this works is they're using an EEG helmet. They map your brain. This is a one of my clients who was going to climb to Nepal and we wanted to train his brain. And then based on goals, electric uh, impulses are put through this cap and it retrains your brain. So I have used this um, to increase mental acuity. You know, our mental capacity changes, our agility changes over time. And I have used this. So we can train both our emotional brain and we can train our physical brain. So those are, th those are things that we can do for to prepare for peak performance. But remember, this one thrills me the most as a sports doctor, the resilience factors that all three research groups exhibited, one of the biggest ones was physical fitness. So now I'm gonna share with you some really actionable ways that we do that. I'm going to skip a couple of slides here. So before I do that, I want to I want to share with you a few studies that we did at the University of Pittsburgh 
through the performance and research initiative for masters athletes. Cause again, I, I don't want you to think that we're just on another fitness craze and that there's nothing we can do at our middle ages to change the trajectory of our physical performance. In fact, I hope in the next four uh, slides that we totally debunk that, that there's nothing we can do. In fact, we are in powerful control of our physical bodies and therefore our brains. So I studied master's athletes. Um, and these are the variety of studies we did, uh, all starting with the senior Olympians, those people 50 and over who have won their uh, state senior Olympic games and then compete at a national level. The first thing I did was survey them. I wanted to know, well, how do you, how are these athletes feeling? Are they really feeling more resilient and hardy than um, the population would have us think we are? So I love this survey. 64% of people felt an average of 11 years younger than their actual age. 40% were living healthier and more physically fit than they did in their 20s. 57% uh, were more physically active than their parents were. And I love this fourth one. 33% boasted they could beat their kid in a sport. So these are really resilient people. So I'm gonna show you one. This is Sonia, she's a teacher. She's uh, in her forties. And in Pittsburgh, we sponsored this race called the Liberty Mile, a straight shot down a road. Sonia, and we sponsored the master's heat, not the elite heat, this master's heat. Sonia won this heat in 445. You see that off on the side, 445. She won the whole heat. Numbers two, three, four, five you see in the back are the men that followed her in. But Sonia and all these men are mere mortals like you and me, hardworking people who invest every day in their mobility. And what do I believe? What is my mantra for working every day? saving mobility is saving lives and they are great examples. But the first study we did, and I just want you to take this to heart, answered the question, when do we really slow down? Because if you believe Hallmark, we slow down when we turn 40 or 50, right? That is not when we slow down. If we invest every day in our mobility, this study that I did on 3000 masters athletes showed that we do not significantly slow down until we are in our 70s. We slow down less than 2% a year between 50 and 70. After 70, we ex almost exponentially slow down in terms of physical performance. And that could be because we get hurt, because we just don't wanna train as hard anymore, or because the exercise economy of our joints and bones starts really kicking in. But what this really tells us is that we do not have to slow down long into the foreseeable future. So dysfunct the myth that society tells us that all the mobility effort we put in is not gonna help. The next study I wanna show you is probably the most popular uh, um, public, publicly popular study I ever did. And what it shows is that we can retain our lean muscle mass if we work at it. So this is an MRI study. Uh, these are axial cuts through the thigh of people from 40 to 85. You see in the 40 year old picture, 40 year old triathletes have, have um, meticulous muscle architecture, very thin peripheral fat. When I measured the intramuscular uh, adipose tissue uh, microscopically, this, this 40 year old triathlete's leg is not marbled. There is not much intramuscular fat. But then in my control group, what happens? Well, you see it every day in your clinic. You sit around for 35 years, your muscle architecture becomes unrecognizable as in this picture. You build thick rinds of peripheral fat and this control group person is incredibly weak. These are the people that fall down from a standing position, break their hips that you have to fix. But look at this 70 year old triathlete's axial slice. It is nearly indistinguishable from the 40 year old example here. And when I looked with it, with uh, at the intramuscular adipose tissue, it is not marbled. So the way I like to explain this is not only that we can retain our lean muscle mass and our strength 
but we are not destined to go from flank steak to becoming a rump roast unless we choose to sit around for 35 years. So I wanna show you the next study, but before I do, so this is at a tissue level, people we can maintain muscle throughout our lifespan. And I'm gonna show you how, I'm gonna actually prescribe for you how to do it um, at a tissue level. But look what we can do at a cellular level. Stem cell, muscle derived stem cells or satellite cells, see if I can get this to run. Satellite cells are all the rage now. If you're reading any kind of health and for fitness, uh, uh, studies or even pop culture, everybody's talking about satellite cells. Well, these are satellite cells that I grew in my lab at the University of Pittsburgh in 2000. Little did we know that our muscle, adult muscle derived stem cells were the now famous satellite cells, but we did do experiments on them. I wanted to know, okay, we know from a tissue level, we can preserve lean muscle mass, but what at a cellular level? So we took our little old lady mice. We had a whole, whole uh, animal facility full of little old lady mice and we uh, biopsied their thighs and we isolated their satellite cells. And what we found is that the little old lady mice stem cells were no longer plump like healthy cells, uh, like grapes for those of you that don't do cell culture. They were not producing any growth factors and they had turned on, went signaling towards cell death. We then took our little girl mice and we ran them twice a day on treadmills. And listen, they don't want to do it any more than we do, but we encouraged them and they did it. And what do we find in two weeks? We found that mobility is the fountain of youth because their spindly fibrotic stem cells had now plumped back up into grape-like cells. They were now producing growth factors and they had down-regulated went signaling towards death. So if there's one thing that can reverse um, aging at a cellular level, it's mobility. So the final study, well, the next to final study I did took five years to do. And basically the punchline is that the same mobility we're doing to preserve our lean muscle mass, to preserve our strength, to, uh, rejuvenate our stem cells preserves brain function. So we measured brain function, the uh, those things that make us human, not our medulla, but our um, cortex and found that we retain our executive function in our brain statistically higher when we interject mobility every day into our lives. And so the last field of study before I left the University of Pittsburgh was starting to ask the question, why? What was it? So we started measuring this protein called Clotho in our athletes. Clotho is a goddess um, who spins the thread of life. But Clotho, the protein, was described more than 30 years ago. It is a circulating hormone whose expression declines with age in mice and humans and is uh, given credit for many age-related phenotypes, including sarcopenia, cardiovascular disease, and cognitive decline. So I wanted to see in my master's athletes who were so functional, who were not declining, what their level of clothos was. So when I measured their circulating clothos level, Interestingly, the bar to the right is the level of clothos in athletes over 75. But most importantly is the bar on the left. That is the lowest level of clotho in non-athletes under 75. So it shows us that the longevity protein clotho is higher in exercising elderly than in sedentary youth. Interesting, right? It is the efforts you are about to make in your physical resilience uh, will be beneficial. The research shows it. So you all know that there are five pillars of health and I'm not going to talk about all of them today. I'm gonna to talk about three of them, uh, three things that you can do. 
So this is a picture of a mitochondria I took in college, 56,000 times magnified with its surrounding endoplasmic reticulum. It's everything I'm about to tell you to do as a surgeon to boost your peak performance through physical activity is centered around strengthening our mitochondria and metabolic health. If you're gonna do one thing, my friends, cause you're busy. If you can't do all the things I'm about to tell you, you do one thing and that is build lean muscle mass because everything you see on this slide, whether it's mood and stress and hardiness or metabolism or longevity, energy levels, your immunity are affected by the quality, the quantity and the health of your lean muscle. So if you do nothing else, find a way in your day to build lean muscle mass, but not by lifting mamby-pamby pink weights. No, in mid-age, both men and women need to lift heavy and we need to do plyo. What does lift heavy mean? Lifting heavy is the amount of weight that you can lift only three to six reps times four sets. So this is not a medium weight, a mamby pamby weight, four sets of 15. No, you will not stimulate enough stress to build uh, lean muscle. We must lift heavy to uh, stimulate maximum force and satellite cell replication. We must lift heavy to stimulate nerves to fire more muscle fibers together, to recruit um, muscle fibers. Lifting heavy increases your metabolic rate. It will burn more fat. It will completely uh, transform your body composition and it will help you with posture and stability. On top of lifting heavy three times a week, I want you to build in some plyo, some jumping, some box jumping, some jumping down from a box, jump roping if you want, but this will cause strong stimulus for epigenetic changes leading to bone strength, muscle power and composition and contractile power. So I know that, that uh, there are many, many popular ways to lift, many groups like Orange Theory or Peloton, but unless you are lifting heavy, you are not building power. And that's what mid-age and above people need to build lean muscle mass and stay healthy. So if you only have time for one thing, choose this. But if you have time for the second thing, I'm gonna tell you now how to be most productive and to make your mitochondria and muscle most healthy aerobically. Now, I have to admit to you that for a very long time, I loved high intensity interval training five or six days a week, gunning it out. I got bored on a treadmill. I would uh, do all kinds of intervals. Well, if that's how you work out, you may have already experienced what many of my patients experience, which is no change in body composition. You, you get hurt real with regularity. Then you have to take time off. Then your brain goes unhappy because you're no longer producing dopamine with the spikes of adrenaline you get. But I have to tell you that high intensity interval training is not the way pro athletes train. Pro athletes base train. 80% of the time it is low, relative low heart rate base training because it is most metabolically efficient. So in my patients, the way I determine where they're most metabolically efficient exercising is, is to measure a lactate threshold. It is the point where our bodies switch from fat oxidation to carb burning. It's that crossover point and the heart rate associated with it that is most metabolically efficient. So we have the ability to measure lactate threshold for when you do not have the ability to measure lactate threshold, it's usually very low heart rate around 125, not 186, which we're capable of, but around 125, depending on the shape you're in. So how do you use that zone two training? Zone two is the heart rate where you are burning the most fat as fuel in your mitochondria base training. You are to do this three hours a week for 45 
minutes to an hour at a time. It's going to seem like you're not doing anything. But by the end of this, you will have broken a sweat. And trust me, this, this will change your body composition. Zone two, three hours a week. Then twice a week, at the end of zone two, like say you do your zone two, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Monday and Wednesday, when you're totally warmed up from your zone two, then you can sprint. But not for long periods of time. I sprint for 30 seconds and then completely back off. So how this works for me, just so you have a real number examples. My zone two, 125 beats per minute is achieved with an elevation of three to four on a treadmill and a speed of 3.9 to four. 45 minutes of that, then I sprint. I just punch the 11 and I go as fast as I can. My heart rate goes up to 186 for 30 seconds. And then I punch three and I completely recover. And then I punch 11 and do 30 seconds of that. This sprint at 85 per max intensity will stimulate change in body composition, decrease inflammation, it increases mitochondria, um, decreases insulin sensitivity, and frankly, release stress and builds confidence. You feel like a million bucks. So number one, build lean muscle mass. Number two, zone two train, because it's most metabolically efficient and you're not gonna get hurt this way. It's another one of my patients doing her zone two training. And I know you're sitting there like, yeah, but I like to have high intensity interval train, but you got to ask yourself, what are you, what are you on the intense exercise merry-go-round for? Because if you're like my patients, you're hurt with some periodicity and then you have to sit out. So zone two, three hours a week and two sprint bouts. Okay. So that's two things. Number three. This is the last thing I'm going to teach you to do. When we eat, insulin spikes. You know, you eat carbs, you're shoving down the graham crackers in the surgery room. It causes your sugar to spike. Then your pancreas kicks in, obviously, and your sugar drops. And then you're hungry again. And then you're exhausted. If we can eat in a way, that we do not insulin spike by eating protein, by ordering, by eating our food in a different order. It does all these things. By preventing insulin spikes, you are preventing insulin insensitivity and the diseases that come along with it. If this is the only thing you change in your nutrition, do what I'm about to show you. The way you prevent insulin spikes is two ways. You focus on protein, one gram per lean uh, ideal body weight. And number two, believe it or not, there are studies that show that we can prevent spikes by eating our food in a certain order. So I'm going to show you what preventing spikes mean. This is my glucose curve from a day last week. I am not a diabetic, but I am such a data crazy person that I wear this continuous glucose monitor. Because I wanted to know what the effect of the food I was eating was on me. I wanted to know what the effect of the exercise I was doing was. And you see here that between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. that my blood sugar varied almost none. Highest was 88. All I did here was eat my food in the way I'm going to teach you and eat one gram of protein per lean body, ideal body mass. So what do I mean by eating my food in a certain order? I'm not telling you to go on a diet. I am not. I am telling you to um, eat your fiber and veggies first. Literally, you've got this plate of food. I want you to eat your fiber and your veggies first. What that does is that creates a net of roughage in the bottom of your stomach onto which you put your protein and your fat. Roughage digests very slowly. That's why horse, uh, cows have four stomachs, very slowly. Then on top of that, you put your protein and fat, and then you eat your carbs last. Carbs are not first. They're gonna make your sugar spike and you're gonna be hungry again. 
But with carbs on the last thing you eat, they are digested more slowly, right? This simple change will have profound changes in the way you feel, your energy levels. Uh, I've done this. It feels remarkable. So those are the only three things I'm going to tell you to do. Lean muscle mass, zone two training, change the order you eat your foods to prevent sugar spikes. But remember, if you have to choose, the one thing to do is contract your skeletal muscle because contracting skeletal muscle causes the transcription of clothos, the longevity protein, and builds your physical body. Contraction of skeletal muscle causes the transcription of a protein called galanin, which travels to your brain and increases hardiness. So if you do one thing, build lean muscle mass and then contract. Okay, I'm almost done. We've talked about a lot of things about peak performers and how to prepare and how to practice, right? How to be authentic, to act in your passion. When we practice, we've talked about preparing your perspective. We just spent a very long time talking about preparing for pressure, both mentally and physically. And then finally, as you've learned to do this, please bring up the people that you take care of, all your fellows, your residents, the nurses that work with you. As you're becoming a peak performer, learning how to be resilient, both in mental and physical, don't forget to prepare your people. So finally, you know, I'm wrapping up I'm returning to this slide of Lake Nona. Remember we talked about peak performers are capable of having hope to envision the future. They can conceive of things not yet created. And so this is a picture of Lake Nona 10 years ago and Lake Nona today, where I'm reminded every day living in a place with peak performers, how to envision what we want to happen. And it just takes the kind of preparation that we talked about today. So I, I hope you found some of these concepts helpful. And again, I'm so thankful to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was great. It, it, it gets me back, Vonda, when we used to go to the gym with Gary Gruen on the trauma rotation. I know. And how we made fun of him, right? But he was we did. Right. He was right. And that was over 20 years ago when he would take all of the residents on the trauma rotation up to the gym and we would do in between cases or at the end of the day, just a short little workout together. Uh, and that he was practicing all of that. He was getting us moving and he was bringing us all there with him to, to enjoy that activity. So I'd like to open up the Q and A. If you have questions for Dr. Wright, please put them in the, the Q and A section of the Zoom platform. And to be happy to get those out there. But I'd like to ask a question that, that was in the chat and also for myself is, what is the timeline of this peak, right? You talk about peak performance, we're, we're building up there. Are we staying there for days, decades, you know, years, or is it this undulating performance? Or so I, I, I guess when I'm, I'm thinking about it, I'm like, am I, I'm, when am I going up to my peak? How long am I going to be there? Mm -hmm. Do I ever come down the other side? So the way my perspective on peak performance, and I think that this goes back to, you know, when I was talking to my husband, Peter, this morning about this and the perspective of how do, how do pro athletes stay in peak performance? Now they clearly peak at, at, at playoff times, but his words were even in the dog days, the 1,440 minutes a day that where we have the opportunity to either be average or peak, that we have peak performers will work to make every moment excellent. So for me, you know, if I'm talking about an OR situation, I don't let anything slide because I believe that in every minute we have the opportunity to be excellent, right? We just don't. So even though not every moment is that the time slows down, I'm in my head, I'm, you know, I'm doing something miraculous or Russell Wilson's doing something miraculous. 
But I think as peak performers, we do work to make every moment excellent. So, so excellent is the habit because then our whole bar is higher than if we go, okay, we're going to accept some substandard. And then we try to peak. Our peak will be lower instead of, does that make sense? Like every moment is mm -hmm. not a Deepak Chopla flo floating above his body, time standing still, but every moment can be excellent. And that's what peak performers do. No, I, I completely understand that. I feel that sometimes people want want to feel like the Deepak Chopra where we're elevated above our bodies for years on end. And that's just not really the realistic. It's it's how you're training your brain to handle certain situations. And then once you get to this kind of, like you're calling it your peak, yeah. then you start to operate within that, that set of um, skills or mindful habits as your days go on is kind of how I'm looking at it. Yeah. Um, Someone had asked about zone two training. Is there a specific type of zone two training? Could it be swimming? Could it be, yeah. could it be anything? It can, because it's based on heart rate and workload. So if you're on a bike and we do a, an actual lactate threshold, we'll tell you how many Watts uh, you're in. Um, but you know, without that test availability, it's usually 60 to 70% of your maximum. And it's heart rate based. It can be anything. But what you have to do is avoid the temptation to speed up because then you flip out of uh, zone two, stop burning fat, and then you're just calling on your glucose reserves. And it's not metabolically efficient. But here's the thing if you zone two train, the, the research behind lactate threshold was all done in Tour de France riders, they are not gunning it in all the time, 80% of the time, they're in their lower ranges of heart rate, even though they're, they're doing a lot of work because they're in such good shape. But even zone two training will help your high, higher levels be better, zone three, four, five. And I've seen that as I've been doing aerobics this way, that my sprints are better. I mean, I'm a short person. And, and when I started, nine was my sprint. But now 11, it's fine with me. So your zones four or five will get better. And therefore, zone five is up your VO2 max. Right. But training at those high levels will not benefit zone twos. It doesn't go backwards. It goes two will help the upper ones, but the upper ones will not help. And it's, and it's, it's kind of like a pivot in your mind, right? Because most of us, or not most of us, a large portion of us were athletes where we're going hard in drills and sprints. And I was even of the mindset, you know, you and I talk frequently where if I wasn't dripping in sweat at the end of a, um, a workout that was at least 45 minutes to an hour, I felt like I was not accomplished. But I've also slowed down over the last, I'd say month or two, doing a lot more hiking, walking on the treadmill, and have noticed uh, much uh, different results than I, when I was maxing out on my cardio. Because a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are like, you know, we have to do a lot of cardio, 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 cardio. And, and I kind of look at it as my heart only beat so many times in my lifetime. I want to, I, I want to save those ones for when, when those moments matter. So, so I've definitely subscribed to the the zone two, and it's really easy to figure out your zone two based on your heart rate, your resting heart rate. You can find those on the internet. There's oh, multiple sure. tools that you can do. Yeah. Um, someone had asked about, you know, using a lot of the rage now is cold baths and, you know, as a way to recover, we see athletes doing it in movies. We see athletes doing it in real life uh, and what your perspective is on using the cold plunge baths. Yeah, you know, it's so popular. So uh, the the real research is inconclusive. We've used it for years in, in sports with the cold tubs. And, you know, the thought is surrounding it uh, decreases inflammation and boosts the immune system. It adds to resi mental resilience because it's just so hard. Um, but, you know, the causality research is, is not there. So it's, it's kind of in the trend basket, in my opinion, the, um, the, 
temperature that you need to be at is about 50 degrees. Oh, or if you're taking a cold shower in the morning for about four minutes, it's a long cold shower. But you know, you have to be really careful. I'm just going to put this out there. If your body's reaction to that kind of shock is to gasp. So if you're doing a cold plunge into ice cold water and you gasp, that's when people drown. So just be careful if you're going to do it. Great. And then another question we had is how do you avoid joint injuries when you're doing these max weights, the three reps? Is it, is there any tips or tricks or um, opinions that you have regarding that? So the first thing I want for those, for those, um, now men can get osteoporosis too, but um, at different age periods. For the women in the audience who are perimenopausal, 45, menopausal or postmenopausal, and you have not had a DEXA scan, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but doctors don't even do what we tell people to do. So if you have not had a DEXA scan, because insurance in the United States will only pay for one when you're 65, and by then we've lost 20% of our bone density, which is enraging, go pay for one yourself and get one because I want to know your bone density before I tell you to go out and back squat, deadlift, and really pound on the weight. So if you think you fall into that category, please go get a DEXA scan before you do what I'm about to tell you to do. So if you have, you know, if you already have arthritis and known uh, and known arthritic pain, you'll have to modify. That being said, uh, powerlifting is bench press, deadlifts, which really don't hurt your knees and squats, which may. But if you have never done it, the way you do it is to work on your mobility first and you're, you know, just becoming fluid, start with lighter weights, even start with machines. If you want, I, I hate machines, but start with it just to get into it. You may want to hire a trainer. And then once you have, you know, you've worked that muscle memory in, then you just have to be meticulous about your form. Um, that's my best advice. If you want to weight lift and you're worried about your joints, and I, this is not me being a hater. I really admire CrossFit people. They're so frigging strong. But if you're worried about your joints, you need to be in a place with mirrors. Mirrors are not to check your look. Mirrors are to check your form. Yeah, I, you know, again, through our conversations and just doing my own research, I've been lifting a lot heavier Mm -hmm. Um, and I've noticed a, a real difference and everyone kind of knows me in that I, I love Peloton. I'm not going to do a plug for them. Um, but once I started varying my workouts and getting off of a spin bike, uh, I was, I, I was burnt out from doing the same thing over and over again. Yes. And so I think, you know, a lot of us just, we're very regimented and we aren't, you know, willing to kind of push our boundaries. And, and that really goes with your mental resilience, learning a new skill, right? Kind of branching out and doing something that's maybe a little bit more uncomfortable. Well, and it can uh, be something silly, Lisa. You, uh, learning a new skill is like, you know, just Googling on the internet and right. learning about a subject you don't even know. I mean, sometimes I listen to master classes about fashion and I am so not into that, but you know, it's just learning something that doesn't have to do with medicine is great for mental resilience. And, and, and how we talk about, you know, that we take really good care of our patients, but we do a pretty poor job sometimes taking care of ourselves. Um, I think it's very important. I think you really hit on it in that even when we go through these things that are, you know, making us resilient, confronting our fears, having role models, religious and spiritual practice, mm -hmm. the physical fitness is really the foundation, right? And how many times do we all get together when we're at meetings and stuff and we, we backstage our, our physical fitness, you know, we're with friends and we don't have time. And that's the, the thing that people say the most is I don't have time. Is there, you know, you said that three hours a week for zone two mm -hmm. um, and some weightlifting. If people can't do that, is there things like you, you know, like the 
the treadmill desk? If you just get steps in, like steps was all the rage for a while. Do you find that? Well, you can do zone two on a treadmill desk if you have one, right? Mm -hmm. if, you can, if you have 10 minutes between cases, you could climb up and down the stairs. I mean, anything is better, but here's the deal. I have myriads of examples, people you and I know who, we can make the, I'm about to tell you, we can make the time. We have to schedule an appointment, you know, and because there are way too many surgeons, the minute they retire, they die. And I know three in this year. And it's really a devastating thing that they're just, we just don't take care of ourselves, right? We can't do what we're really good at unless we do, right? I mean, that was kind of morbid, but it's the truth. That's what really motivated me to start talking about these things to surgeons and planning programs for surgeons. Because it's, I feel like it's unfair, right? We toil our whole youth, we devote it to, and then just when we're about to enjoy it, because we have ignored ourselves and gotten unhealthy, cat catastrophe happens. So it's just preemptive, right? Yeah. And that's the whole mind, the whole mindset pivot or shift is that, you know, what was done decades ago, how surgeons handled themselves and how they did their practices is very different than what we have now. Cause we're not even, you know, I, it's, I was just at home with my mom and my kids and we talked about raising kids, right? How different it is now than it was, you know, 40 years ago when I was in at home. And it's the same for medicine, right? Our yeah. pressures are different. Our documentation is different. Our responsibilities are different. And then we're constantly comparing ourselves to other people on the internet. And other people are comparing ourselves to us by Google rating us. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, you have these constant external pressures and how we deal with those is what really gets into your mental resilience and your hardiness. Yes. And, um, I think if we continue to do what we did decades ago, that we're gonna have a, a whole cohort of people that aren't going to, you know, be these peak performers or go into longevity. And we even have now, you know, um, I don't wanna say that we have these different generations of people who are coming up, but different people who who are more about happiness and you know their mental well-being being and their mental health so i, see I do appreciate in our residents i see that 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 orthopedics is important but maybe it's number two or three on in total life and i don't know if i would have said that you know other than my children and my husband but i'm not sure i would have said that and i think lots of young doctors are more apt to say that than maybe you and i were yeah, there's no way we would have ever said that because people I would have would never have said that. Right? <laughs> no one would ever have said that. I was not raised that way. But you know what? Maybe they're smarter than we are, you know, honestly. Yeah. Um, and it, it's also, you know, uh, interesting, I, you know, as I was sitting here listening is, you know, we, we sit and look at our patients and most of us may be orthopedic surgeons or have some sort of prescription for therapy for our, our patients, right? And when they come in and they say they didn't have time for therapy, we kind of look at them through that judgmental lens of oh, yes. you didn't have time, but to, you know, when there's one finger pointing at someone, there's always three pointing back at you. And it really kind of brought it to a perspective for me of if I'm going to sit here and um, not judge, but form opinions of my patients that are not doing what I've prescribed them to do, why aren't I doing what I've prescribed myself? And I think that's a great way to look at it. It's a prescription for myself. Well, and here's a tip that I tell people when they ask me, how do they possibly get it in? And this is what I use because um, unless I specifically plan the workouts I'm going to do every day, I do it for a month. I know what I'm doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I knew what I'm doing the other four days. I have it on a big calendar. Uh, it's the, the lifts are pre-scheduled. The zone two is, is it doesn't take an appointment, but the lifts are pre-scheduled and, uh, 
then I make it a, I'm a visual person. It makes it a big deal when I go back to the, it's the micro reward of going back to my calendar and just circling that I did this really heavy lift and what my max squat was and making a little ritual. So it's special, but pre-planning it because it will not happen ever. If you just leave it to chance during a day, it will not happen. And, so, and we plan so much of our lives, right? I mean, we talk about surgical planning all the time. We don't just walk into the OR and throw up our hands like, what we're we doing today? Just like we don't, well, I hope we're not. Um, and just like you don't go to the grocery store without a plan for what you'd like to make because you'll just wander around aimlessly. So I think that's really what it comes. And when people ask me about how I get my workouts in and how I stay active, I'm the same exact way. I know, well, I don't do it for a month, but I do it for a week because what you've shown us is that if we move, we're going to continue to uh, live healthier, longer lives, healthier yes. into our longer life. And, you know, when we give so much to this profession, when we leave, we need to have something left for us. And that's truly what this comes down to is I hope that people have taken away from this that you are worth the investment. You invest in all your patients and we all know that you're doing the best that you can, but you need to now turn around and make that investment in yourself because there's, there's science behind it, as you've shown us. And, um, if, if nobody wants to retire and just sit on the couch and watch, you know, daytime TV. So, right. And you're worth it. I mean, doctors, you're worth it. Yeah, for sure. Um, if there's, I don't think there's any other questions in the chat. I would want, I just want to say thank you. I think this is something that we don't talk about enough. Um, it is a little bit touchy feely, but very important. And uh, it may be even reaching out to people who weren't on this that you feel would be, um, would benefit from some of this information. I know we've recorded it, so it will be available, I believe, um, through the AO archives. So again, thank you um, and please, Dr. Wright had her or does have her phone number up here. Um, if you have questions, please reach out to her or you can reach out to the staff at AO who can also get you in touch with her as well. Any last thoughts, Dr. Wright? Well, you know what, I'm thrilled that that almost a hundred people showed up tonight because um, we're all busy people and, and I really do cherish and that you honored us with your presence. But but what you just said is so critical, Lisa, you are worth the daily investment in your health. You are worth it as much as your patients. And I hope this has been helpful. Mm -hmm.